Glenn Van Zutphen on Saturday mornings with Neil Humphreys on Money FM 89.3. Welcome back to Saturday mornings here on Money FM 89.3. Glenn and Neil with you all the way up until noon today. And this idea of ESG, mm. environmental, social, and governance, uh, has been in the you know in the corporate mind and corporate eye for many years now. Mm. Um, but it's taking on increased importance as people want to do the right thing for the country uh, for the country in which they live for the environment for the world uh, and also it leads to some impact investing as well which is a very popular element of esg now let's talk to jackie hawking who is the ceo and storyteller for vs story uh, jackie welcome to the show i know you you've been doing quite a lot uh, in relation to this topic tell us what the latest is on on esg and the impact investing yeah, thanks, Glenn. I was just trying to think when the first time I think we met was back about 10 years ago when I started my first company here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> back then what we were trying to do, I came here as an entrepreneur to really see how we could help these companies shift away from CSR. Because to me, that was always very short-sighted. You know, company makes money over here and does good on the side. And what we saw was this huge potential where you could actually bring the purpose of the company to benefit the environment, to benefit their employees, and to just have a greater benefit, you know, overall. So what we've seen over the last, like, five years, and especially recently with COVID, it's ex accelerated, and that dream has really come true, right? Investors are now seeing, like, they want to invest in companies that are more socially responsible, that are more environmentally friendly. We're seeing a huge shift in the energy sector. Everybody is trying to be more renewable now. So I think what we imagined 10 years ago of helping companies to discover purpose has really come to life in the last like one, two years. And also, Jackie, on that point about corporate social responsibility, I think consumers are changing as well, aren't they? Even my daughter, she's only 13, but she's aware of certain brands that do or don't do the right thing. And she's, and I find that fascinating that young mm. people particularly will not shop at certain places or will shop at certain places if those particular brands are doing the right thing for the environment, for social enterprise and so on. I mean, is this something now that you and companies have to think about more and more? So absolutely. I mean, it's not just the employees, right? I mean, when we looked back at it, this is why we're trying to tell people this is not, you know, a nice thing to do. This is like a business demand. Yeah. Because it's not only the people that are going to be buying your products that want to preference more socially responsible products. But what about your employees? How many people want to work for a company that's, you know, destroying the environment, right? So it's about retracting talent. It's about being able to turn your customers into ambassadors so they really care about your brand. Um, you know, it's about attracting the right investors. You know, holistically, the entire company is going to be impacted if you don't think about ESG. And that's not even entering risk. I heard you guys chatting about property markets before, and I was kind of mm -hmm. laughing to myself. You know, imagine putting $20 million on a nice beachside apartment with the climate change is going to destroy that valuation in the coming years, right? So I think mm. environment more and more is becoming a core business strategy rather than just something on the side. So I'm just curious, Jackie, so put us, put us in the seat of what you do. So you go into a company, you have a meeting, you pitch or however it works. What, what do you do? What do you go into the company and say and do? So I'm probably the unique example in the world that is not one of these people that had the corporate job and quit to go and save the world. I actually did it the other way around. So I started my career back in 2008 um, on a climate change you know, project with the UN, and I was sailing around the world as a documentary filmmaker. So I was having like the dream job, you know, documentary filmmaker, going around the world, learning about climate change, trying to find solutions. Um, I really believed that solutions existed already. They just need more visibility. So I started my career as a documentary filmmaker. And over time, I decided that I needed to get to Asia. I needed to be based either in China or India to be at the heart of where all of these environmental challenges are. And to actually, instead of raising awareness about all of the solutions, actually work with the companies. So I kind of made that shift into business in the last, like, yeah, five, ten years. Mm. Uh, fascinating, Jackie. We're talking with Jackie Hawking, the CEO and storyteller, VS Story, an ESG turnaround strategist as well. And Jackie, as you look at the what companies are looking for, first of all, are, are you seeing a split between uh, Singaporean, local Singaporean companies versus international companies or any certain industries where uh, they tend to be more ESG friendly or ESG curious? Uh, what are you seeing in terms of the clients or the people that you're talking to? 
Yeah, so this is a massive debate that causes a lot of, uh, I guess, question. So on the word on the street, right, is that local companies, especially here, are less interested in ESG and it's a much more mature market overseas. And now everyone I speak to tells me this, but from my personal experience with all of the family offices, with all of the people that we meet here, it's actually top of mind here in Asia as well. So I think that there's a little bit of a misconception that Asia is behind. Perhaps that's, you know, a little bit slower to the take on some of the investments that they're making, but it's definitely, definitely going in the direction. It's inevitable that Singapore is going to be a front runner in this space. We can see that from what the government's been doing, you know, with the green plan and this very, mm -hmm. very uh, forward thinking in the way that we're moving. So I think what we're going to see here in Asia is a bit of a leapfrog. I think a lot of the SMEs here are going to leapfrog. They've maybe been waiting for the technology to become a bit more mature. Um, things like solar energy, perhaps, you know, 10 years ago wasn't quite ready for mass adoption. Now they're looking at even smarter solutions. Um, the Global Compact here in Singapore just released a document, if just for anyone's interested, a couple of days ago. And they had a big like roadmap of how SMEs can kind of adopt more, you know, environmental strategy into their business plan. So I would argue that it is here in Asia and that we're actually going to see a leapfrog and the companies that are actually leading this space will become, you know, they'll start attracting the talent. Because that's the big war. Every man and woman and CEO is trying to find the best ESG consultants and leaders right now. And the talent drain, I think, is going to come to here in Asia. It's fascinating, Jackie, I'm listening to you. I'm just wondering, how do you address the issue of risk? I mean, you mentioned SME there. Mm. Of course, every company across the world wants to be greener, wants to be safer. That's just common sense. They want to uh, use less, consume less, and uh, do their bit for the environment. But there's a risk element in terms of cost. Uh, an SME may say to you, yes, of course, I want to kit out my entire office, my entire factory, my entire building with solar panels, for example. But it's going to cost me this much. And I don't know if I'm going to get the return of investment on those panels. What do you say to SMEs like that in those positions who want to do the right thing, but are worried about the cost? I would flip it around and say, look at the risk of what happens when all of your top leadership quits the next year. What happens when that next year you're unable to recruit anyone from those MBA universities because everybody has gone to work at your competitor because your competitor stands for higher purpose. So I think people are looking at risk in the wrong way. They're not thinking that actually their shareholders and investors right now are actually preferencing those businesses that have put in their B Corp assessment or their impact measurement, right? So I think there's a huge risk of not looking towards environment and social impact, um, much more than any risk in terms of, you know, taking on the wrong technology. Um, one, maybe one other thing to comment on that, you know, you know, background in storytelling and being a documentary filmmaker, there's also a huge risk in comms. Like if you're coming from an industry, let's say, palm oil in Asia, you know, all, all of these terrible industries that have a very negative environmental impact. Now, the risk there is looking like greenwashing, and we're seeing rife greenwashing throughout the industries right now. And I would say the three kind tell of... Us a little bit more about, tell us what, a little bit more about what that greenwashing might look like for somebody well, who might not be aware. On a live radio station, I'll have to bite my tongue. <laughs> yeah. Well, but, no, but you don't have to give company names. Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking of more obvious examples like fossil fuel companies that will invest yeah. in green initiatives. Is that the kind of thing you're talking about? Or? No, absolutely. And I'd say that anyone that's involved in the greenwashing, we're seeing that right now in, you know, a lot of like unnamed companies, but I would love to name. But, uh, you know, when we look at things like waste, right, waste management, a lot of, a lot of mm. companies that need to do more investment into this space, right? They can't just talk about it. They really need to take action. Um, at the same side, on the energy companies, you know, I, I will name this one because it's, it's public information, but Chevron, you know, was missed their target dramatically. They were supposed to hit a five-year target of, you know, carbon capture, and they missed that in Australia. So I think there's a lot of talk happening right now. Um, and so what we do as a storytelling on comm side is like, number one, you have to be honest. Like, just be honest. Like, we've messed up in the past. Or, you know, family business, previous generations, we didn't know what we know now, right? So if you're honest, the next part is like, how can you be hopeful about the change that you're going to show? You know, show like what you want to do to change that. Like, yes, we destroyed this area of the rainforest, but we are hopeful that we can do something better. At the last piece, it's most important. I think every company right now needs to be helpful. They need to end that story by saying, look, this is our ideas. What ideas do you have? And they have to start reaching out across sector to start collaborating and talking to each other, sharing best case practices. I would love to see, you know, and we're seeing that a little bit in the waste sector, you know, all of these people coming together to see, okay, how do we stop plastic waste? How can we collaborate together? And I think we're going to start to see that across, across the board and everything. I'd love to see that in like human trafficking supply chain. 
how can competitors mm. actually start seeing each other more as collaborators to try and solve some of these challenges? Yeah. Uh, talking with Jackie Hawking, uh, CEO and storyteller at VS Story. Jackie, this is a multi-part question, so I, I, I don't want to give you too much to chew on, but um, I, I'd like to understand how is it different for a family office, an SME, an MNC to, to start uh, putting in place some sort of ESG program in their organization you know does it have to be with a heavy technology upgrade like solar panels or a new way of recycling or are there simple steps let's say for an sme that doesn't have as much money or as much capacity for change what what is that what does that uh, that tier of changes look like yeah i definitely think that the first step across the board for any organization or entity has to be the purpose like why you're running the company in the first place Right. If you don't understand that, if your employees don't understand that, if your customers are just buying your product for the product's sake, a product doesn't sell anymore. People want to buy the purpose behind the company. So I think mm -hmm. that is the first step. And then whether you're a smaller company or a larger company, you can start to use free frameworks. It's There's no cost. So every time people tell me it's expensive, I kind of you know debunk that relatively quickly. Yes, there's a manpower cost involved, but we're talking one or two people from your team can go and do a free assessment like the B Impact Assessment, that's a B Corp tool, you can Google that later. That tool will help you put in line some of the policies and frameworks to educate you, to see what you've done, what you haven't done, and to benchmark you against other companies. So you'll kind of get a score that you'll know where you sit, where you are on your, you know, on your environment, where you are on your social you know, practices and policies, and then you can start collaborating to see, okay, where do we need to improve? So I think before implementing anything, Step one, figure out what your purpose is and why you're doing it so that you can rally people together and get that resources and inspiration because ultimately everything is about people being inspired, right? If your team is inspired about protecting the environment, they're going to put more energy into it. And then all you need is a free, simple tool to measure it. And then you can start rolling out and deciding what the best decisions are. And that next step is, is you know, complicated. And that's where it's start deciding, you know, what technology you're going to use. But to be honest, I think that's the easy part because there are so many solution providers out there. You know, one of my pro bono clients I work with in Indonesia, they're making packaging out of seaweed. They've had this technology for years. All they need is people in Singapore to really come and like scale this product up here, you know? So you know, re reach out. If, you, if you're a company, you want to distribute this kind of packaging, the technology exists. What we need is more of that mindset and adoption and people to be inspired to get involved, you know, a more connected collaborative ecosystem. Yeah. Yeah, Jackie, you mentioned there about the team element, you know, a happy team, more productive team. And I'd like to focus a bit on the employee because I know you mentioned just now an unhappy employee or an employee who doesn't advocate some of the practices you have in your company is going to work elsewhere. I hope at an idealistic level that's actually true, which is what I'm going to ask you now. Are you seeing that increasingly? Are people genuinely making job and career choices based upon the practices of the company? Because I'd like hmm. to think that, yes, a Singaporean listen to this will not work for this MNC because it's done this to the environment. But I also think there's a part of me that thinks if that company offered them 10 grand a month, they'll say, I don't <laughs> care what they're doing to the ocean. They're paying me 10 grand hmm. a month. Are you seeing a discernible shift in mindset when it comes to choices for employees? Yeah, and actually it's really funny because I think when I first met Glenn, he was trying to teach me how to do public speaking, and 10 years ago I was terrible. But one of the first TEDx talks that I did was basically telling everyone at a huge FMCG multinational, it was their internal TEDx, and I was like, don't quit your job. <laughs> and it was like a plea, like, please, if you care about social impact, don't quit your job if you want to change the world. Because if we want these companies to change, we need change makers inside these companies. I need them. Everyone needs them. And it's really hard to say that. But like, honestly, you can make the biggest impact inside your job. So the reason that I'm such an advocate of people to stay in their companies is because we're seeing a huge drain of people quitting, starting their own social enterprise, which, which is exciting. And I like that. And I can be a testament, you know, just out, we're a very small company, but we probably get 100 applicants a day from like really senior people in senior positions and I can't offer you know a quarter of what they're getting paid but they're inspired by the story right and they want to make leave a legacy and make an impact and I think the more we start to see these you know climate emergencies around the world the more like COVID perfect example people forget that was caused by biodiversity loss right conservation we're going to start to see more people wanting to really how do you look your grandchildren in the eye and say look you know I was in charge of deforesting an area where all of these you know wildlife is being destroyed 
people want to leave more of a legacy. So I would say it's a it's a huge challenge for companies to attract the best talent. On the on the plus side, if you come out as a purpose driven company, you know people will leave their university. They'll come straight to you rather than going to all of the other ones. So yeah, yeah. it's a huge challenge. Jackie, how do people get in touch with you if they want to learn a little bit more about how they might start or continue their ESG journey? Yeah, I think like a lot of, you know, social entrepreneurs, system entrepreneurs, I would say anywhere on the internet, I'm pretty easy to get a hold with. Um, so yeah, just Googling our company, looking up, you know, on any of the social media channels of your choice. So uh, and when you get a chance, when we get off this interview, go ahead and put your uh, URL in our chat, will you, on Facebook Live? Yeah, awesome. Would love to. Right. Thanks so much, guys. And nice to see you again, Glenn. It's been yeah, a while. And you, Jackie. Yeah, thanks so much, Jackie. Jackie Hawking, a CEO and storyteller at VS Story. Thanks for being with us on Money FM. See you.